You know the story with Hashem Stapala. He walked into a restaurant and said, if you're not going to feed me, I'm going to do what my father did. So the guy got nervous and he fed him. Came back the next day, he said, if you're not going to feed me, I'm going to do what my father did. He said it very forcefully. So the guy for a couple of weeks was giving him free dinners and one day he says to him, exactly what did your father do? He went to sleep hungry. <laughs> so the last thing we did properly was Tchias. I started talking about Tashlich. Tashlich is a very interesting story. It's a very interesting story. Because for 25 years, from nine, the Rebbe came here in Tafshin Aleph, the first Rosh Hashanah by the Rebbe was Tafshin Beis, 1941. Till like 19 Tafshin Chavav, 1966, about 25 years. It was way after the Rebbe became Rebbe. The Rebbe used to walk to Tashlech. The Tashlech is about a mile from 770, maybe a little more than a mile. If, if you girls, if you walk down Eastern Parkway towards the, towards the Grand Army Plaza, you, everybody walks on the parkway, nobody walks on the sidewalk. But you pass the museum, right, the beautiful museum, it's gorgeous. I don't know about inside, but outside it's gorgeous. And then, then you have the, the library. Between the museum and the library is the park. That's called Botanical Gardens. It goes from Eastern Parkway till Empire. Most people who visit the Botanical Gardens, they go in on Empire. They don't realize there's an Eastern Parkway a entrance. They used to go in that entrance. Um, it was a gate, it was a door that was open, you walked in. To walk out was a turnstile. You know, it means, in other words, you can go out, but you can't go back in. Because it had, like, bars. Pardon me? It's still there. The tragedy is they're doing the whole northern part of the park they're redoing. I think they're even going to change the lake. The lake that the Rebbe said Tashlich by, they're redoing. If you ever visit Botanical Gardens, you have to be either a geek or love peace or a combination thereof. But if you want, you'll see the northern part of the park has been closed off for several years. They're working, they're redoing the whole thing. So I, I'm hoping they'll leave the lake intact, but I'm sure they're going to change the fence. Someone should go steal that turnstile. That's the famous story of the Rebbe climbing over the fence. Happened right there. The, what you see at Eastern Park was what was there 50, 60, 70 years ago when the Rebbe went to Tashlich. I'm afraid when they're done with redoing the park, understandably, they're probably going to take it away. And if some Lubavitcher has Seichel, he'll go and steal it, <laughs> that turnstile. The story is... The st and whatever, <laughs> or, or send it to California and put it in the Chabad house. Um, the story was that one year it poured, tough changes and it poured terribly, it rained terribly hard. So they closed the park. The Botanic Garden closed at 5 o'clock. It's normal, 9 to 5, 9, 30 to 5. But on Rosh Hashanah, they knew there were so many from Yidin living in this neighborhood at that time, in the 50s and the early 60s. I read someplace, a quarter of a million Jews lived in Crown Heights. A quarter, 250,000 Jews lived in Crown Heights. Way past Eastern Park, way past Lefferts, from Flatbush all the way to Rochester. It was packed with from Eden. Every kind of community had their own shul and their own community here. They had schools here, there were a bunch of Ebbets in Crown Heights. And everyone went to Tashlech. So they kept it open, they kept it open until like seven o'clock, till the sun went down. On Rosh Hashanah, and of course they didn't charge admission. Um, but one year it rained so hard that nobody came. So they closed the park at five. The Rebbe left 770 at five, and the Rebbe, not shot the Rebbe, not in the spoil from the rain. The Rebbe gets a special pleasure out of walking in the rain. He gets a special pleasure out of chassidim walking. In other words, to not care what the world is saying and doing is, the Rebbe walked to Tashlach. I don't know what he did with his siddur, but he walked to Tashlach in the pouring rain, and it was locked. The Rebbe climbed over the fence. The Rebbe was over 50 years old. He climbed over the fence. And my father was a witness, my uncle was a witness. He was a how The Rebbe, in Tavshin Yudzani, was about 56. No, no, 54. And people tried to help the Rebbe. It was a tall fence, 12 or 14 feet high, the fence. And people tried to help the Rebbe. Mutchkin tried to help the Rebbe, and the Rebbe turned and looked at them like Agatas. <laughs> the Rebbe climbed all by himself over the fence. He dropped himself on the other side. <laughs> it was probably a combination of metal and stone. It was probably a gate. I Meaning the door is not 12 feet high. But the gate is 12 feet high. And then everybody climbed over the fence, and Nebuch, the Elton of Sidim, <laughs> needed a boost. That everybody clambered over the fence in the pouring rain. They did Tashlich. To go out wasn't a problem because of the turnstiles. So just getting in was hard. By the time they got back to 770, it had stopped raining. <coughs> People wore colored hats in those days. They didn't wear black, they were gray, they were blue, they were beige. Whatever color your hat was, was the color of your shirt and your beard. It was, the, the, everything ran. I'm assuming that the dyes were different then as well. 
And the Chevre spontaneously, when they came back, started dancing in front of 770. On Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe walked out of his room with a battle of mashke. The Rebbe Rosh Hashanah is very busy and also very earnest, and he started giving mashke. And one guy looked too good, the Rebbe touched his hat. <laughs> it was dry. And the Rebbe says to him, what's this? So there were two people. One person says he changed. I think him the Rebbe gave. Another person said he knew about the forecast and he went before the rain. The Rebbe said, I'm not giving you. You didn't walk in the rain, you're not getting. But the beautiful part of the story is that J.J. Hecht, Harav Yankov Yehuda Hecht, all of Hashom, Zechein and Levracha, he used to speak in 770 at all the big Fabrengans. If he has any grandchildren in the room, I, I, I'm just going to say something very nice about your grandfather. They used to have these big Fabrengans. And the same people spoke at every one of the Fabrengans. Nobody prepared. They just got up, whatever came. They said the same speech every year. If you're a Hecht, your grandfather always prepared. He never came to 770 unprepared. And he always had something original to say. Every time he spoke, he said something interesting, novel, that nobody knew. And you knew Rabbi Hecht, when he spoke in 770 to us, he respected us enough to prepare. So one time, his speech was that he had a big shul, the largest shul in Islapush. He was a very big rav, a very prominent rabbi. He had hundreds of congregants. And he asked the Rebbe whether he should join the Rebbe for Tashlich, because if he joined the Rebbe the whole shul would sit and talk about the, the Brooklyn Dodgers. Rosh Hashanah. So the Rebbe told him to put on the sink, to put on the sink in his kitchen, and take Tashlich with the water in the sink, to stay in shul and fabreng with his people, learn with them, give them the Vyasaidurus, and that during a Sarah Simichuva he should go to a place with his fish and say Tashlich. A lot of people who don't have Tashlich and Yomtev, you go during a Sarah Simichuva. So uh, he did that. That year when the Rebbe climbed the fence, see, he must have heard the story. I mean, it was like in the story, the Rebbe climbed over the fence and the whole thing, and they gave mashke. When Yankel Hech came to the Fabrengen, and the Rebbe gave him mashke, by, the Rebbe gave him wine, Matzah Rashana for Kesha Baruch, the Rebbe leaned forward, and he whispered to him in Yiddish, yesterday when I was climbing over the fence, I said, ah, oh, what a pity. Yankel's not here. <laughs> I showed Yankel. They said, what a pity Yankel is not here. They never wanted him to participate. But of course, the story that I, I probably told the story with Zalman Posner, I told you that the first year, Tafshim Beis, Kran Heights was not full of from a Yidden. It was full of modern Jews who later moved to the island and back to the city. Kran Heights was like, Kran Heights was like the Beverly Hills or even more exclusive of Brooklyn. And Brooklyn was the richest borough. Brooklyn was the richest of the five boroughs in those days. Rich people didn't live in Manhattan. They didn't long ago live in Brooklyn. And Crown Heights was the, was the creme de la creme. It was the apple of the eye of Brooklyn. And the feeder cab, of course, moved in and ruined the neighborhood. I wish the neighborhood would stay ruined because nobody can afford to buy a house. I mean, it's impossible unless you're push it rich. My students, my friends are all moving away. They can't live here. So <laughs> apparently the property value really went down bad. Um, so the neighbor walked out of 770. The neighbor asked... The year before he wasn't here. They, they, the first time, the Fidika moved to 770 right before Rosh Hashanah, but the Rebbe was still in France that year. So the following year when the Rebbe came, the Rebbe first of all asked if there's a place to do Tashach, and they told him, yeah, said, what time are you going? Five o'clock. Five o'clock, the Rebbe walked out of his office. There were about 80 men, which I thought was a lot of people, and they started walking, and the Rebbe stops. The Rebbe was then, in 1941, the Rebbe was 39 years old which means he was a relatively young man, and he was also very unknown. And the Rebbe says, Nitaze Gateman, that's not how you walk. So everyone stops. The respect they had for the Rebbe, the respect that people have for the Rebbe because of his presence, not because of what he said, but his presence. So it was, he wasn't a Rebbe yet. He was so awe-inspiring. If you met the Rebbe face to face, his presence just, it, it created a respect. Nitaze, everyone stopped. The Gain Svei say, why don't you take a pair and march like uh, in, in uh, formation, like soldiers. And then the Rebbe thinks for a moment, und zogen anigen, and sing. To sing in Kran Heights then was such a chutzpah, it was such a bold move. So that's how they went to Tashlich all the years. When the Rebbe went to Tashlich till 19, probably 66, 65, 66, Rebbe used to walk. And he had his partner. The Rebbe's partner was Chad Lekov. The Rebbe walked ahead of the procession. The Rebbe walked very fast. Everybody followed behind the Rebbe. In the later years, it was one of the sites of Crown Heights. The whole of Crown Heights used to come out to watch the Rebbe walk to Tashlech. It was from, it was, at the end, in the 50s, it was from. But the, the Crown Heights Jews, all of them, were very proud to live near the Rebbe. They weren't Lubavitchers. When they had a problem, they came here, they were very aware of the Rebbe. And many, many people would stand and watch. Many people even would join the procession, would walk with the Rebbe. He walked very fast. But that first year, 1941, Tashin Beis, 
Then I walked out of the procession, they started to sing. And all of these ref conservative and reformed Jews came out of their homes. They'd all been in temple that day. Nobody was working. To watch the scene of the Hasidim singing, it was really, really uh, an invasion of their space. And the Rebbe walked back with Union Street. He didn't go the same way both ways. He would either go back with Eastern Park, come back with President, or with Union. Sometimes, I, I, I think he always went to Eastern Park, but he didn't come. He always went on a different street back. Zalman Posner tells the story. He was about Mitzvah Yingle, and he was so embarrassed by this. So he said, I learned the power of prayer. I asked the Abish that, that next year I shouldn't have to be so embarrassed. And the Abish answered his prayer in the form of an old chassid who pushed couldn't walk fast. His name was Abshmol, the Mashpir, Reb Shmuel the Vitten. He walked slowly and he also davened slowly. I, I heard from people, I don't remember Reb Shmuel, that Asha Yotzar, Asha Yotzar, took him five minutes. He was a Gvaldaki Yerish man. He was pushed a God fearing man. And Asha Hakalim it was 60 seconds. A bracha. Every, he makes hundreds of brachas, maybe hundred brachas a day. Every bracha was a minute. He was a he was an eloch yid like like you didn't see a hundred years ago. He was in a different world, different level. So Stashach took him twenty minutes. So Reb Shmuel asked Zalman to walk with him, and Reb Zalman was delighted. And they came to Tashlich when Reb was leaving already. He walked slow, Pashit. Anyway, they did their thing. It took a long time, and then they went back also with Union Street, which is how the Rebbe went back. And many of the people who come out of their homes to witness this spectacle had already gone into the house, but some were still outside. And a man walks up to Zalman, who was 14 years old, grabs him by the co by the coat by the jacket, and says, "Why are they singing?" And Zalman is thinking, "This is the Abish, the sense of humor. I don't have to participate in the mart. I have to just explain it. Yeah, how am I going to explain that I'm mad that we should walk and sing? It was such a crazy thing to do." So he doesn't know what to say. So he starts to stammer, he starts to stutter, and before he can get any words out, this guy tells him, I'll tell you why they're singing. He says, they walked by. He says, every Jew, this man, this middle-aged American Jew, so every Jew has inside an uh, ember, a gachelis, a fire. But it gets sleepy, it gets fashlovin. It becomes latent. He says, when they walked by, and they were singing, I'm proud to be a Jew. I'm proud to be a Jew. And I promise you they were not singing, I'm proud to be a Jew. They were singing some Yiddish or Hebrew song, but that's what he heard. I'm proud to be a Jew. That ember ignited and burst into flames, and he walked away. He told Zalman Posner what the singing accomplished for him. And it was a lesson. Yeah, it was a lesson. A young American boy who's going to become a part of the most unusual and different army that one of the things that Lubavitch does is make noise. You know, we started the Miftsoyim, he's got in the streets of the mitzvah tanks with the noise. So unless you were the kind of guy who liked noise, you were so, it was like weird, why are you making noise? We sound like the, the African Americans with the boom boxes. You don't even see them with boom boxes anymore, but in the 70s, every African American had a boom box. But you realize that you were getting people's attention. And we assume it's bad attention. We assume that they don't like us and they think we're crazy, but Quite often, the attention is unbelievably positive. And, and it's all the Rebbe. This is all the Rebbe's, These are the Rebbe's brain children. You live in America, do as Americans do. Americans show off, we're going to show off Judaism. Americans make noise, we're going to make noise with Yiddishkeit. And, and we see the success. But this is, as Alman put it, the first time that Rebbe showed his hand and how we thought about the Yiddishkeit in America. Anyways, Tashle, 25 years that I went to Tashlech, I don't know exactly how many. By the way, there's actually a picture. The last time that I went to Tashlech, my father told me, he comes to the lake. It was a little, it was a man-made lake with fish. There's a row of tripods. Click, click every newspaper in New York took pictures of the Rebbe. And then there were probably 20 or 30 papers. Today you couldn't get two papers out of New York because everything is electronic. And the Rebbe was photographed. He didn't do this, you know. And he came back and says, I'm not going to go next year, even if I have to do Tashlech, and I say, I and they dug and they found behind the library, behind the building next door, they found a, 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 a fountain, a well, and they made Tashach over there. And then some 20 years later, they built an apartment for the Rebbe and the Rebbe. Because the Rebbe couldn't walk anymore. The Rebbe couldn't go home. So the Rebbe used to stay in his room for Shabbos and Yom Tev, And the Rebbe was alone on President Street. So they built an apartment in the back of the library. And the Rebbe needs to come. Every Shabbos, every Yom Tov, we say Rosh Hashanah, we say Yom Kippur, we say Sokas. Every Shabbos, and the Rebbe used to walk across the little deck for them to get the Shabbos. So they had to destroy that Tashlich behind the library, and they made it where it is now, uh, behind seven seventy. And the Rebbe used to Tashlich. Tashlich, no big deal. They went out, read a few words, shook a tzitzis, and that was the end of that. Now, one of the big chedushim of the Rebbe 
was the idea that he said a maimed with a fabrengen. The earlier Rabbi in Rosh Hashanah, Bachlal, they said a maimed, they became a set of maimed. The second night of Hashanah was a maimed, the third night of Hashanah was a maimed. The Rebbe made a fabrengen, what's a yamtif? And he washed, and he ate a suda, and he benched, and he gave kesh al In the beginning, he would wash and bench, and after benching, he would say the maimed. But much, within a few years, the Rebbe changed that. Matzah Rosh Hashanah was always the fabrik. At, after every big yantif, Matzah Rosh Hashanah, Matzah Shemchas Terem, Matzah Pesach, Matzah Shuvot was a big fabrik. Maybe it's the comment before the Shkia. Let's say the Shkia is now around, what, uh, 735, something like that. That became, let's say, 725. They would wash, he would check his nails. This is actually filled with the Rebbe washing. Check his nails, he would wash his hands. Beautifully, everything the Rebbe did was so exact. But you could watch the Rebbe, you could learn so many things from observing the Rebbe do this. And then he ate a little challah. I mean, there wasn't exactly chicken and soup and fish. There was challah. And in the early years, they used to drink soda, uh, seltzer, a couple of sel- soda. In the later years, I don't even think he did that. And drank wine. That was the whole soda. And there was fabreng. The Rosh Hashanah fabrengans were short. They were not long. Some chastayla fabrengans were very long. The Rosh Hashanah fabrengans were quite short, uh, within an, less than two hours, let's say. But the fabrengan was dominated by two features. One feature was a maimir. Matzah Rosh Hashanah was a long maimir. It could be an hour. It was one of the longest maimadim of the year. And there's actually a reason why. And the Rebbe said why. Because the Rabbeim had a minik to start saying a maimir chassidus when it was still Rosh Hashanah, to finish the maimir chassidus when it's for sure no longer Rosh Hashanah, to connect the head to the body. That was the logic. So the Rebbe would start a maimir right away, came out, almost as soon as the Fabrengan would start. And the maimir was very long. And he would start the maimer with it. So the Rosh Hashanah I finished bringing Matzah Rosh Hashanah. The Fabrengen, that was probably 70% of the Fabrengen was the maimer. There were a few short sikhs, but the preeminent feature of the Rosh Hashanah Fabrengen was a long maimer. And the Rebbe used to always ask that we should sing a niggin before. And we would say a niggin with a maimer, with a niggin. The Rebbe had a style of saying my modem where he would remain sitting and he would speak like a sikh, except the words were the words of a maimer. So we shouldn't have to stand up. And the Rebbe used to keep his eyes open. When the Rebbe said a maimer chsidus, he would ask for a niggin. And you would see, if you were paying attention, it would lean forward. You put it down in his pocket, you pull out a kerchief, and you can watch the Rebbe wrapping it, and you can see. Then lean forward a second time and wrap it. My brother and I used to creep under the Rebbe's table, and we could look up, literally, under the floor, and watch the Rebbe with the kerchief. As children, we did this. We came out like chimney sweeps. <laughs> there, was, there was schmutz down there from 20 years, and we would go, we would clean it all out. We were not the only kids who went, so it was cleaned up from time to time. Remember once, once a pace, and we went and we found a whole chalas sitting underneath that platform. Um, that wasn't good. But, um, and the Rebbe would put on a kerchief, and we would sing a niggin, and everyone would stand up. And then would close his eyes, and bend his head. So the maimah usually was harder to hear, because the Rebbe wasn't sitting up, his head was down. But a maimah ke'en sikh, the Rebbe would just sit like a regular sikh and talk. But Moser Rosh Hashanah, until Memvav, this time of the last year, by Yechulu, I think it was Vayichulu, Matzah Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe s- stopped saying my mother with a niggin, and then in um, Tess, when the Rebbe didn't pass away, the Rebbe stopped saying my mother altogether. But the Rebbe say a maimah Rosh Hashanah, a long maimah. The other feature, which is unusual, Rosh Hashanah, and this you know about, this is what they call Seydin Nagunim. The Rebbe started this. That he used to ask that you sing a niggin for the Baal Shem Tev, for the Bezitcher Magid, for all the Rebbe, from the Alter Rebbe, from the Middle Rebbe, from the Tzemach Tzedek, from the Rebbe Marash, from the Rebbe Rashab, from the Friedrich Rebbe. Each Rosh Hashanah. Later on it became other times as well, but from the beginning of the Nesiyas, Rosh Hashanah, the Rebbe mentioned each of the Rebbe. Um, as soon as the Rebbe started, I don't know when it started, but Yael Khan, the Rebbe turned to Yael. Before Yael Khan was a yid named Shmuel Zalmanov, who I imagine most of you never heard of, but he was a very, very big chassid. His son just recently passed away. Shmuel Zamanov was, a, was very close to the Rebbe, very close to the Rebbe. He was the Menagin. He had to move to Israel around 1965. And when he moved to Tzitzel, so Rabbi Yael got that schus. Rabbi Yael turned to Rabbi Yael to start the Nagunim. Um, and he can feature one of the Rebbe in order. Um, also, during the Fabrengen, the Rebbe found a way of mentioning each one of the Rebbe by name. He would tell a story. He would mention each of the Rebbe. So later on, in the later years, Rabbi Yael would sing a niggah for each one of the Rabbeim. And when he finished the Fiyadik Rebbe's, he would, without asking the Rebbe permission, the Rebbe never said, sing my niggah, he would sing either Hu'a Lekeinu or Atav Chatanu. If it was Shabbos, it was Hu'a Lekeinu. If it was a week, he would sing Atav Chatanu. And then at some later point yet, after he sang the Rebbe's niggah, he would sing the Rebbe's father's niggah. Ay, 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 ay. And the Rebbe really liked it. The Rebbe was happy. So you have really ten Rabbeim, if you count the Rebbe's father, right? From the Baal Shem Tov till the Rebbe's nine. 
So they ended up singing the, 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 a nigan from each one of the rabbeim, including the, the rabbi's father. And during the course of the Fabering of Matzah Rosh Hashanah, the rabbi used to uh, mention the rabbeim by name, he, and, he, and he would say that the Gemara says that every single morning in the Beis Hamikdash, they used to say, Hey, Rapnea Mizrach Acha Bechavren. They wouldn't start doing the avoid and say, The sun has reached Chavren. Chavren is a few minutes west of Yerushalayim. So they would start a few minutes after Nesachama. They waited for the sun to get to Chavren. So they didn't start today, Mamish at Nesachama. They waited a few more minutes. Why? Because they wanted to mention Chavren. The only reason, the Gemara says, the only reason they did it is because they wanted to mention Schus Avis. Avram Yitzchak and Yankiv. So every morning in the Beis Hamikdash, they would say, "Hey, Pnei Hamizer, Acher Bechavrin." So the day would start in the Beis Hamikdash by mentioning the Beis Ha'elam of Avram Yitzchak and Yankiv. So the Rebbe used to say, "Our fathers are the Helikat Abayim from the Baal Shem Tiv. and the Rebbe used to sing a nigiv from each Rebbe, and he would also say, he would mention them, he would tell a story, he'd say Advar and whatever it was. This was Rosh Hashanah. After the Fabrin, the Rebbe gave Kesha Bracha, which could take. Keshe Baruchah could take longer than the Fabering in itself. Fabering could last an hour and a half. Keshe Baruchah could take two or three hours. If we gave everybody, you would walk by, they would look into your eyes, L'chaim L'vracha, L'chaim L'vracha, L'chaim I am too young for this. But in the earlier, earlier years, when Lubavitch was smaller, the Rebbe gave you wine, and you wouldn't walk away. You would stand there, and the value the Rebbe is giving the next person, and you would say a Baruchah Be'er Piyagofen, taste a little bit, and then lean forward and say to the Rebbe L'chaim, and as the Rebbe is pouring wine to the next person, or the person after the next person, the Rebbe answered the Chaim of the Bracha. When I was a little kid, my father used to say to me, when you go up to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe gives you one, make a Bracha, drink a little, and say to the Rebbe the Chaim. But I, my childhood begins, my, my memories, early 70s, mid 70s, it was no longer possible. They were moving you too fast. In the 50s and even in the 60s, they let you stand there. You got wine from the Rebbe, you didn't walk away. You stood, and you would make a Bracha, sip a little bit of the wine that Rebbe gave you, and then say to the Rebbe L'chaim, and that would answer you to each person. He was doing two things at once. He was giving wine to the next guy and answering L'chaim and to the person before. And they used, he would walk away right in front of the Rebbe. He would walk backwards in front of the Rebbe. Then later on they changed that also. You would just continue going. But when I was a child, you would get wine from the Rebbe, and then you would make a step down, and then walk, looking straight at the Rebbe, you would walk down a path out of the shul. That's how it was for many, many years, until probably the early 80s, late 70s. Now, the next day is a fast day, it's in Gedali. So the Rebbe made a minik, right? The Rebbe reintroduced the old minik. It says in Halacha that on a fast day, a fast day you're a lot of work. A fast day you're a lot of work, right? Except for Tisha, but you're a lot of work on a fast day. But it says in Halacha that there was a tradition by Jews that at midday they closed their businesses. If you were a businessman or you're a shopkeeper or you were a producer of material, after lunch you would close your shop and go to Shul. You would have an early minik, and then you would hang out till the end of the fast. What did they do in Shul? So the, one of the members of the community would get up and speak Divrei Musa, Divrei Hussein. This is brought in the halacha. But people stopped doing that. No one did it anymore. You know, you came to Shul early and you spoke about the Taylor. So in 1978, Tafshin Lamet after the Rebbe's heart attack, the Rebbe turned around and asked Sada Betavis. And he spoke and he said, I don't know why people stopped doing this meaning, but we're going to bring it back. And every fast day after Mincha, the Rebbe used to speak Asada Betavis. Tainus Esther, Shiva Zabatamuz, and Tzayim Gedalia. So the Rebbe Dav Mincha 315, the Rebbe got Maftir always, it's 315 Mincha. And after Mincha, we spoke a Sikha, and after the Sikha, the Rebbe gave dollars through the Tankistan. In the later, later years, the Rebbe used to give dollars himself, but the Rebbe used to give to the Bachram, the boys that went in the tanks, they would give them dollars, and they would give each one of us a dollar, and that's how we celebrate our fasts, or commemorate our fasts. The Rebbe used to speak every year after Mincha, and the Rebbe's style, the Chlal, like everything is, when he started on a new Indian, the first few years, he would introduce the basics. You know, what does the fast mean? And, and then, of course, once he did it, he would say, I already spoke about it, so I'm going to speak about other things. And the Rebbe did this for about 15 years, from Lamed Ches till Nun Beis, that he spoke on all the fasts, beginning with Asad Abetavis and ending with Asad Abetavis. Now, what happened to Asad Abetavis? So, Amolek Ketzaitin used to be a Fabrengen for the Rebbe's mother's yard site, Vav Tishrei, the Rebbe Dabin for the Yomid, Maidiv, Shachris, Mincha, and we all came and got places. We want to hear the Rebbe Davin. The Rebbe is Davin Shabbos. Vav Tishrei could be Shabbos. And you heard the Rebbe singing, uh, whatever. Who all came? The Rebbe did Mamish sing. Okay, Lord, and there's some interesting things, but I don't have time to go into these details. I remember that in Tafshim Memhei, which was the 20th yard to the Rebbe's mother, after Maidiv, the Rebbe started talking. I had a very good place. I was very close. And there was no mic. He started to talk. He says, It's 20 years since my mother passed away, so I'm going to give money from Keren Chana. To anybody who's going to build a mikveh. And of course, as soon as the Rebbe started talking, it came by the way noising and pushing, and they went to get the mic. Um, but the Rebbe done for the Yomit. 
Much of, and they, of course, he always went to the oil, went to the rabbi, went to his mother. And much of Vav Tish was like the Fabrengen. The Fabrengen of Vav Tish day was not always a, a Sedesi Mechuvah Fabrengen, it was a Yardside Fabrengen. A Yardside Fabrengen was marked by the Siyum. Let me speak, on the Yardside of his mother, on the Yardside of his father, and on the Yardside of his Rebbe, the Fiyadikir Rebbe, the Rebbe said a Hadrin, a Siyum Sechd. On his father's yard site and his mother's yard site, that was the preeminent picture of the Fabrengen. The Rebbe didn't even say a Maimed always. Not always was a Maimed Vav Tishrei. Sometimes there was, sometimes there wasn't. The prominent feature of the Vav Tishrei Fabrengen was they said a Siyam Sechta. And the reason is because people used to fast on the day that your mother passes away. The Rebbe didn't want to fast, so the Rebbe made a Siyam Sechta, so it became a Yom Tif, so he didn't have to fast. That's the excuse. But the Rebbe always made a Siyam Sechta on his mother's yard site and on his father's yard site. And then, of course, when the Rebbe and Chai and Mushka passed away, there was no more week to Fabrengen. No more. So the Rebbe stopped Fabrengen of Tishrei. And it became the day for the, Menach, for the uh, Machane Soul Development Fund. This is one of the late features of Lubavitch. All the good clips of the Rebbe talking to people privately, the Rebbe made a, a, a fund where people gave him money. You had to give him $100,000 over five years, or you can give him a million dollars, or 10 million, whatever you wanted to give. But it was divided over five years. And they got to meet the Rebbe twice a year before Pesach and Tishrei. All the men and women would come, the women separate, men separate, and the Rebbe would speak to them as a group. And then as couples, they would have like a mini yechidas. And they would sit for hours and talk to each one of them. And each time you came, you had to give $10,000. So it's twice a year, times five is $100,000. The money was for the Rebbe to use however he wished, no questions asked. And it had to be in addition to all the other money he gave to Tzedakah. And it was an opportunity, an opportunity to meet the Rebbe, to talk to the Rebbe, to have questions. And you could see all those delicious films that you see in Gem, where people are talking to the Rebbe privately, and it doesn't look like dollars. That's what it is. It's Machne Yisrael. So they did it on Vav Tishrei. They would clean out the shul, they put in mechitzah. Some of these people were very rich. A lot of them were not from, had to make the shul. How do you make 770 and look normal? What the answer to that question is, you can't. <laughs> There's no way. But they tried. They didn't put drapes to block the pipes, you know, the poles and the ceiling. Don't ask. The ceiling now, has a dropped ceiling. Then it was just beams. The ceiling of 7-7 that you see is lowered by four or five feet. It was four or five feet higher. And it didn't look pretty, but it served its purpose very well. So that's what happened above Tishrei. Um, now, Erev Yom Kippur, we don't say Tachnan, by the way, but it's one of those interesting things. The night before you do say Tachnan. Erev Yom Kippur, after Chetaz, you don't say Tachnan. The Seder by the Rebbe was that he came to shul 7 o'clock in the morning, which was the Rebbe very early. And the Rebbe's chicken was waiting for him in his room. They brought the kapodah for the Rebbe. The Rebbe did kapodahs. They would walk out the front door of 770, walk to the side, where they make that big sukkah, and the shaykhet was waiting for him, and he would, uh, he would shech the Rebbe's kapodah. How long was the Rebbe in the chicken? 15 minutes. Uh, how much time did it take with the chicken? I don't know what kind of fabreng he had with the chicken, but... <laughs> The Rebbe came at 7, by 7.15, 7.20. He came from his house. By 7, he came up with the chicken. Um, the shaykhet for the first 20 years was a chaser by the name of Rabbi Echen and Gordon. Rabbi Echen, he probably has children in this room. When Rabbi Echen and Gordon passed away, it became the... That's Who? Yechenen. Yeah, he, great, great yeah, he was a very special... Yid. What is your name? What? What is your name? Maya. No, your last name. Oh, uh, Gordon. You're Josh's granddaughter. Uh, who's your father? Yossi? Ah, okay, all hell, I'll tell you the Yechen was a personality. He's, your father is named after him. Your father's his great, great your great, great granddaughter. Yeah. So he was the Sheikh. And then when he passed away, it became, it, 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 so, so Shimon Kalmanson was the Sheikh. Here's the thing you have to know. If you Sheikh the Rebbe's Kapora, which was considered an honor, you have to stop talking. If you don't stop talking, I would do what my father did, yeah. <laughs> uh, please stop whispering. If you shechted the Rebbe's kapara, you had the distinction or the dubious distinction of giving the Rebbe malchus. It went together. Which means the Rebbe would get down on his hands and knees and you would flog him. Elevim kippur. So it, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't so poshant. Isn't it just an act though? Yeah, yeah, of course. It doesn't matter. The Rebbe's getting on his hands and knees and you're standing behind him and you're hitting him. It doesn't matter how hard you're hitting him. It was very, nobody wanted to do it. But whoever did the kapara, <laughs> did the kapara, had a kapara, you understand? I heard that the first time Yechanan did it, the Rebbe called Yechanan to do kaparas. Okay, fine. And then the Rebbe said, whoever does the, the sheikhet for kaparas, has to get malchus. He pushed it, after he did it, he sat down in shul, and he, he just hit the Rebbe. 
39 times. And he did this very, I, 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 I don't know if you ever get used to such a thing, but I heard that the first time he went into the shul and fell apart. Then we got his hands and knees, and you stand behind him, ooh, it happened, 39 lashes. Of course, you don't really hit the person, it's a symbolic thing, but nevertheless, and that's, that's how it was. So the seven, uh, 720 is Kapar, his Kapar took a minute. He came out, never held the chicken the way the Peter wants to stole the chicken, not by the legs, but by the feather, by the wings, because holding the chicken by the wings is really cruel and unusual. We hold the chicken by the wings rather than by the feet because we're more afraid of the chicken than the chicken is of us because we're really, really good at handling the farm animals. But the Rebbe used to hold the chicken by the wings. He wouldn't hold it like this. You imagine someone takes you by the hands and holds you up and carries you. There's a, there's a name for that. You know what that's called? That's called crucifixion. That's how you crucify a person. So they're, they're really, really right. You shouldn't hold the chicken by the It's just easy. Hold the chicken by the wings. It hurts. So I used to hold the feathers down and hold the legs, which is how my father does it. So most people don't do it that way. The shachtam don't do it that way. The shachtam grab the wings, sh- kill the guy before the bird has a chance to say, excuse me. Um, but then they held the chicken by the wings. He would come to the back of the chotzer. He would hand the chicken to the shechalif, who took it by the wings, and he would shecht it. And he had a little piece of cardboard with some sand. Covering the sand of a chicken is a mitzay de rais. Birds and chayas. Behemoth is not. Birds and wild animals, it's a mitzvah de raise called Kisi Hadam. And he would take three feathers out of the back of the bird after the shechita. He made like a little scoop and he would hand it to the Rebbe. The Rebbe used to make the brocha. He would shove a little sand over the blood which had been dripped on this little cardboard. He would put down the three feathers. He would say, Yachkech, and walk. The whole thing took a minute. The thing that was interesting, and this is true by all the Rebbe, when you shechted the Rebbe's chicken, you could see in the film, this video, the Rebbe, it would shake. Killing an animal, for him. The Rebbe said, the Fidik Rebbe was a shoychet, and nevertheless, when they shechted his kapora, if they had matresel. Anyway, I think the Rebbe went to shachet, to mikvah for shachet, I'm almost positive, but I'm not sure. The Rebbe went to Erev Kippur mikvah once, right? we got to mikvah three times. They went to mikvah Erev Kippur once. Most years, the Rebbe did not go to the oil. Nun Beis, the Rebbe went to the oil. Erev Kippur. That was the year of the stroke. But Azoi, as far as I know, most years the Rebbe, but he went to the Mikvah, because going to the Mikvah, Erev Kippur is a day, I said. And if I'm not mistaken, the Rebbe went before Shachris. Most people, the Ikir is before Minche. The Rebbe went before Shachris. Now, as I told you last time, Erev Yerushan and Erev Kippur were from the few times that the Rebbe davened with a minion. And Shachris was whatever the Rebbe wanted. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock. I think Tak at 12 or 5 to 12 was there of Yom Kippur, Tav Shun and Beis, came very late. The Gabi would announce, Shachas v'zayin v'zayin great. Shachas would be when we're ready, which meant the Rebbe was ready. So it could be whenever time the Rebbe wanted, early, late. It was a normal Shachas, there's no Tachnut, there's no Vinu Malkainu. In our custom, we don't say Vinu Malkainu, no Tachnut. And back to his room. Now, what did the Lubavitch Rebbe do the entire Erev of Yom Kippur? Does anybody know? What did the Lubavitch Rebbe spend six, seven hours Erev of Yom Kippur doing? Handing out honey cake. You think about it, you say, did I have nothing better to do? You must understand, giving lekach is not a Lubavitch minik. The Lubavitch Rebbe, you know who gave lekach in Lubavitch? The Rebbetzin. Seriously. The Chesidim used to come to the Rebbetzin in each generation. The Rebbetzin gave cake. The Rebbe gives cake. Erev of Kippur, Erev of Lekach. Somebody told me, and I choose to believe it because I choose to believe it, it's a munkach minik. The Rebbe had a, a person whom he revered. I mean, the Fiedrich Rebbe was the Rebbe's whole world. The, the person whom the Rebbe followed, in the Yom of Allah Minik, a tiny bit, but still, was but the Choyish of Mokhba the Rebbe, was the Minchas Allah, the Munkach Rebbe, Harav Chaim al Yazza Shapir of Munkach. He passed away in 1937. His, his, the current Munkach Rebbe is his daughter's son. She also passed away young. She passed away in 1944 in Hungary uh, and left a, an orphaned little boy. The car, his name is Rabinowitz, Rabinowitz. The Munkat Rebbe was Shapiro because he didn't have any sons. The Rabbeim held in the Munkat letter by Oilam Amloye. And there are Minhagim that the Rebbe adopted. And I'm not Labavich and Minhagim. There's a Munkat and Minhagim giving matas and Munkat and Minik. That's what I heard. Giving lekach. But the Rebbe stood by his door with his sil- silk apart and gattle, handing out cake. So he baked the cake in, in the Albany Bakery, Allah Shalom, which doesn't exist anymore. I mean, the bakery is there, but they don't bake anymore there. Uh, or, uh, and he would, they would, the cake would come in these big, big boxes, cut into little squares. And the Rebbe used to take the cake with his hand, 
and place it in your hand, no napkins, no gloves, and he would say, Lishona Tevo Mesuka. And the Mesuka was so sweet. Lishona Agut Aziz Yar. He said in Hebrew, Lishona Tevo Mesuka. But he would look at you and decide how much cake to give. <laughs> if you were a Bachar, you got a piece. If you were married, you got a, a whole piece and a piece of a piece. If you were a child, that used to break a cake in half and give you half a piece, or a third of a piece, or two thirds of a piece. Erevim Kippenat. The women got Hashan Erev. But same thing, you put it into your hand. You put it into your hand. So the Rebbe was not so medactic about touching women. There's pictures of women kissing the Rebbe's hand and the Rebbe doesn't stop him. The Rebbe used to give the women Hashan Erev. Not, yeah, yeah, there's, uh, by dollars. By dollars, women kissing the Rebbe's hand and he lets them kiss. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's not a question from the Baba Shadab, it's from Rabbi Abraham Shemtim, so it's like a lot of time. There's videos, there's videos, the women is, the Rebbe let women kiss his hand. The Rebbe used to give dollars to the Rebbe, the Rebbe gave the women, the Rebbe gave women lekach, I mean, whether he didn't happen by mistake, he never touched women's hand, he put it into your hand. Now wait, there was always napkins over there, because you have a few Stateshna people who worry about hygiene. But usually what would happen is they would give you a napkin, <laughs> the Rebbe would take the cake, put it in your hand, and put the napkin on top. <laughs> the napkin was symbolic. The Rebbe used to touch the cake and put it into your hand. Now there's films of the Rebbe giving honey cake. And you could see how he's giving like a, from probably from 10 o'clock in the morning till 2.30, the Rebbe gave cake. 2.30 he would close the door to get ready for Mincha. 3.15 was Mincha. After Mincha was a Sikha. A bracha. After Mincha, back to the room. And he continued giving lakach. Now, Erevim kibbet the mitzvah to eat. The Rebbe fasted. So the whole day giving honey cake. The Rebbe used to go home around 5.30. Yom Tov comes at 6.30. The Rebbe Tzachai Mushka used to say that the man come to him hot in his king. Keach. It's essen. The Rebbe was so tired from giving cake. She put food on the table. You're supposed to eat twice a day. Yeah? The Rebbe gives the all day long. The Rebbe ate one meal. The Rebbe said that he didn't have the physical strength to put the food in his mouth. That's what the Rebbe Zechai Mushkin described. A Gantzit talk. It's not normal. The Rebbe gave honey cake and anybody who wanted came. It wasn't yet to be a Lubavitcher. You had to carry a card. You got in line. And the Rebbe stood hours. I remember I stood with my father for three hours and they slammed the door on us. For Mincha, I was so upset. I took it personally. And my father tried to explain to me that I should try and understand how the Rebbe feels. And I couldn't. They couldn't. Ten more people. The Babish, ten people from the door. They closed the door. And as long as I live, I remember the honey cake I didn't get. You know, the honey cake I got, I remember that pretty cake. But the, the, what I remember most was the time that they closed the door and I didn't get lekach. And, and maybe, it's, maybe it's a lekach. It's a lesson. A whole day giving cake. And you watch. They pick up a piece of cake, looks at you, puts it on a different piece. I once saw a video puts on a piece of cake, flips it with his finger, and the cake flies up, and they, woo, 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 woo. The way the Rebbe gave the cake was also epistruchniistic. This giving lekach, the Rebbe did twice. Did it him a whole day, and the Shana a whole day. But the Shana he stood by the entrance to the sukkah, even if it was raining. Also, with the Shabbos, they took a gatel and a hat. Same say, the Lashana Tev in the sukkah. But Shana Rabbe, the Rebbe gave women also. Men separate, and women said, everybody cake, anybody who wanted. Now around them Vov, 85, 86, 87, which it was, someone come up with a bright idea. Number one, put the cake in a plastic bag, which means everyone gets the same size. The, the business of the Rebbe bringing, when the Rebbe went into Yom Kippur, his fingernail was honey. <laughs> he handled thousands of people of cake, and he would literally break the cake in half, look at you and give you a piece, Lashana Tevim Musukka, a whole piece, a half a piece, a third of a piece, two thirds of a piece. It's fascinating to consider that the Rebbe spent all that time so they decided, to, they got the Rebbe's permission to put it in a plastic bag. So everyone got the same size. If the Rebbe liked you, he gave you two bags. So it was much, much quicker. There was none of this breaking cake and looking at you and flipping it into the air. It just gave you everybody. And so you got Lashon Tebis. So once that started, the Rebbe started giving women also before Yom Kippur. Men and women, you would line up and they would give everybody a piece of lekach. And usually it came with a dollar, because this was already the season that the Rebbe gave dollars on every occasion. And also with a kuntris, with a maimir, with a sikh, or with a letter. And we would get from the Rebbe honey cake. And the other big chiddush was that he didn't do an Erevim Kippur, he didn't sesame tshuva. Erevim Kippur was a very hard day for the Rebbe. And uh, so starting around 86, 85, 86, maybe 87, that means Memvov, 
they would give, the, they would stand, one of the Sesame Chua, could be Vav Tishrei, for hours. And just like dollars. But it was much quicker. Many, many more people were able to go by. And if you came for somebody else, he gave you two bags or three bags or four bags, which meant you got two dollars or three dollars or four dollars. There was no more sitting over there and figuring out how much cake to give you. The whole tzir that they're giving lekach is so personal. They would look at you and decide what cake to give you. What cake? What kind of cake? It's a fascinating phenomenon. The idea is interesting. Um, and that's how it was. Ervim Kippur, I saw now that some privileged characters managed to sneak in and get cake from the Rebbe then. Then there was nothing for Minch. Now girls, I said this, Yim Kippur, you say, you say, Al Chet ten times. Okay? By Mincha Erev Yim Kippur, you're going to say Al Chet in the small, the quiet Manasseh, which means you'll turn to the Dadan of Yim Kippur, you'll start from the kind of Tzed, and you'll read till the end. By Chazar Sashat, you do not say Al Chet, just in the quiet Manasseh. When you'll come to Shul before Licht pension on Yom Kippur, the first thing you'll do is before you start Kol Nidre, say Al Chet. Now, if you come to Shul, the means already saying Kol Nidre, don't worry, you can catch up. The beginning, the first thing you do when you come to Shul the night of Yom Kippur is say Al Chet again. Then you'll say it twice in Maidiv, twice in Shachris, twice in Musif, and twice in Mincha. That's ten times. In the Ili, you don't say Al Chet. You say it four times the day before, that means this year, Tuesday, once in the Shtilish Minesh of Mincha, once when you come to show after Licht Pension, the first thing you'll do is you'll say, you'll t- turn to where it says, the davening, till the end of the davening, you'll say, till the end of Alakai, I forgot the last one, Achaloi, Neidaiti, Achaloi, whatever it is, the, 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 the Alakai, it's not Alakai, it's a different Alakai. Actually, uh, once they tati, you read the whole al you ask somebody in Shul what to say, and in Maidah, you say it once in Shbenesra, there's no Chazar, it's the of Maidah, but the night of Yom Kippur, they read a bunch of pages, and the Chazan will say al again, so you say al ten times. Then we speak a bracha. When the Rebbe first became Rebbe, this bracha was in his office. The, the men would go into the Rebbe's room, until the room was full, and they became a bracha after Mincha, the whole thing was 30 seconds. When the crowd got bigger, they went in in shifts. Men went in, they gave a bracha, they walked out, another group went in, two or three shifts. And the Rebbe used to repeat the bracha almost the same word for word to the different, every year was the bracha was different, but if he said it to two or three groups, it was always the same. At one point, the bracha moved to the show. And there's actually a video, they began up on a little stage. The whole thing was a minute, and here bracha. When I was growing up, it was no longer a bracha, it was a sikh, it could last 45 minutes. I remember the Rebbe once started, the Rebbe bracha, the Rebbe the bracha with the words, Men halten shen itzter by tshuva illoh. We're holding by the higher tshuva. And he spoke a whole sikh, in that sikh he would give bracha, the aces of olive base, from the nusach of the Yimkippur Musaf. Shnas Oira, Shnas Brocha, Shnas Gila, Shnas Disa, Shnas Heid Vahadah, Shnas Vahatev, Shnas Zohar I don't know this from the Machsar, I know this from the Sikhs. Chsodim Gedeilim, and so on, the whole Olive base. And it always finished. Shnas Teira, Shnas Tfila, Shnas Tshuva, Shnas Tahola. There's a lot of Tufts. He went back to his room and gave more Lekach. But the first year, Tuf Shin Yud Beis, 1951, when the Rebbe finished giving the Barakah to everybody, he turned to the Yael Khan, who was 21 and a half years old, and he told the Yael Khan, Zog the bochrim as far kol nidre as they can in Narayim. Tell the bochrim that right before kol nidre they come into my room, but only bochrim, only bochrim. So that year, Yud Beis, the bochrim, they never heard this before. This never happened in the history of Lubavitch. Before kol nidre, all the bochrim went outside the Rebbe's room. The door was opened. The bochrim walked into the Rebbe's own office. The Rebbe was already standing in his talus and his kittel, his kittel and his talus over his head with a siddur or a chumish. And the Rebbe said him the famous words, you learn in the Rebbe's yeshiva, it's like the Dachta Rebbe's kid. You learn in the Rebbe's yeshiva, so you're the Rebbe's children. And the Rebbe gave the bracha in Bechas Habonim. He gave the bracha that a father gives children. The Rebbe didn't have children. It says in the Rebbe's Rishimis, which are now public, that the Tzayt Fayim Kippet from Mishpocha, in the Rebbe's journal, the Friedrich Rebbe told him, at the last hour before Yom Kippet, they kicked everybody out of the house, even the closest people. Only family. The period right from Kippur was mamish, only the children. Even the Shamoshim and the Gaboyim who lived in the house, they would give them hints that they were able to understand that they had to leave. The Rebbe gave a bracha to the Bachrim. This never happened. The Friedrich Rebbe didn't do it. The Rebbe Rashab didn't do it. The Rebbe considered the Bachrim his children. 
And you would, Bachim will tell you. They, when they were Bachim and they would ask the Rebbe a question, the Rebbe would answer them. As soon as they got married, the Rebbe sent them to Arov and to Mashpia. The Rebbe's connection to the Bachim and to the girls. <coughs> the girls were not by the Bracha, but the, the Rebbe considered the Bachim his children, Mamish, until they got married. And he gave them a Bracha. In the beginning, it was in his room. Then the crowd got bigger and bigger, so they did it right outside the Rebbe's room. The pushing was Gefelach. Then they moved to the small shul upstairs. They would empty out all the benches and tables. The pushing was so bad that it would wash it rain. Mamish, it would rain from the ceiling. The perspiration, the pushing was geferlach. So when the rabbi had his heart attack, so they made rules that to be in the front room, the big room, you had to be either 23 years old or a chas. If you were engaged in the front room, if you were 23. To be in the second room, the, between the two rooms, upstairs of 70, there's a window, which is covered by a bookcase. So they took away the bookcase, they moved away behind it, there's svarim, they had to move away all the svarim, and the barchim would stand and look through the window. So if you were 22 years old, or if you were in the kvutz of Manchester, you got to stand in the second room. I was a kid, so we used to go in the, push, in the sukkah outside. And we would come early, the sukkah was locked, and they would open the door, we'd come, we'd push. I, I usually got a pretty good space. I, I would run home, eat very quickly, run to the mikvah, back to 770, and I would be by the window. Now, if, if it was before Yom Tif, then it was on a mic, so you could hear. But, if they came, they never came a few minutes late, they never had an earlier, they never was Makabu Yom Tif earlier, they had a different time. When it came the moment, they never was Makabu Yom Tif, the mic went off. So if you didn't, were not inside, or you're not very close to the window, you couldn't hear the rest of the bracha. When the Rebbe Sarchai Mushka passed away, the Rebbe used to bench licht himself. And the Rebbe came into the bracha to the bacharim after he said bench licht. So after Mem Ches, beginning in 1988, Tafshin Mem Tes, there was for sure no mic, but I was already 23, so I was in the front room. But the Rebbe gave bracha to the bacharim every year. In Maine Yoren, that bracha was already a sikh. And the Rebbe used to speak about the, the idea that bracha should be makar of other chasid tamadiyah yeshiva. The Rebbe used to mention the Ram of Sefi Chashmita Beyevil. That a bocher is Kedish Kadoshim, he's hired in a Kain Godel because his life is Torah. It was a very special moment. The Rebbe treated the bocherim like his children. And after the bracha, they went back into his room, mamish for 60 seconds, and they went out to the shul for a mighty for Okay, we'll do this next time. Okay, I'll see you when I see you. Good.